Welcome to What's Up with Prophecy Today. So what does the Bible teach about Christians gathering together? What does the Bible and Jesus have to say on this topic? Well, first off, I want to share with you this Bible text. It's found in 1 Chronicles 12, 32. From the top tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders. All of these men understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. So these were wise men that studied the signs of the times and based on that, they advised the leaders on what, what's the best course to take. So that's the reason I'm sharing my understanding of future events with you. It's simple. I want you to understand what's coming during the Great Tribulation so that you can choose the best course for the times ahead. So what does the Bible and Jesus teach Christians about gathering together? This is a hot topic in the news today. So let's see what the Bible says on this. And I'm just going to share with you a very few uh, Bible quotes. We'll start off here with Hebrews 10.25. It says, Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of Jesus' return is drawing near. Well, if you talk to people, many people today will say that Jesus is going to come very, very soon. And I'm one of those that believe that. So he, he says in Hebrews that we should not neglect our meeting together. Well, in Acts 4, excuse me, in Acts 2.42, we read, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship and to sharing of in meals, including the Lord's Supper and prayer. So they they worked they worked and learned and studied together, and they had fellowship with one another. Back in Acts, over in Matthew eighteen twenty. We read, and this is a very famous Bible quote, we all are familiar with it, for where two or three are gathered together, together in my name, that's in Jesus' name, I am there amidst them. So Jesus is where you, when you gather together, Jesus will be there with you. Now many people don't really know that the United States was founded by people that were seeking religious liberty. The pilgrims left Europe and migrated to the New World, and that was America, in order to worship God according to the dictates of their conscience. And this, and their desire to, to worship God to the, their, to the dictates of their conscience was uh, included in our First Amendment to our Constitution. And this amendment is especially, was especially added to ensure our religious liberty. So let's take a look and read the First Amendment. It's pretty short. It says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. So the first five words in that amendment I like. It says, Congress shall make no law. There's no wiggle room here. No law means no law. Well, what about religious freedoms in our neighbors to the north in Canada? What do they have in terms of religious freedoms? Well, outside of occasionally watching a hockey game, or purchase of uh, maple syrup to put on our pancakes, most Americans pay little attention to Canada. But there are religious liberty issues going on there. So people in the U.S. that are concerned by the attacks on the free exercise of religion in America should also be concerned by the attacks on religious liberty in Canada. Recently, Alberta's Child and Family Services barred a Christian couple from adopting a child because their religious views about sexuality were incompatible 
with the official position of who? Of the Alberta government. So the people's religious views on sexuality was different than the government. And so they had troubles with the government in adopting a child. Now I want you to take a look at this short video. Uh, it's from Alberta, Canada, where police just recently in this last uh, Easter uh, holiday, where they entered a local church on Easter Sunday to enforce a local law. So let's take a moment and look at this. This is not a rare event. Religious persecution is happening all over the world. They have what they call religious re-education centers, and they're popping up in various countries. This is where they forcibly take people and put them in a room, or in China's case, they actually take people and they have a complete city that is uh, surrounded by police and military, and they're re-educating the religious beliefs of the people there. So now let's take a look at some additional religious liberty issues in the U.S. and around the world. Well, in New York City, Orthodox Jewish leaders are suing to block New York's restrictions where COVID-19 cases are rising. This was a few months ago, this headline. So they were restricting what the Jews could do in terms of gathering together. Again, Catholics and Jews ask the U.S. courts to overturn New York State's order limiting worship to no more than 10 congregants in some communities hit by the coronavirus. They are calling the measure a threat to religious freedom. And the thing that really gets people upset over this is that they're restricting religious organizations to 10 people, but other organizations, they are allowing many more than 10 people to congregate without any uh, breaking any laws. Well, in China, as I've mentioned already, there are many, many religious issues going on in China. As more people in China practice religion, and it's various religion, not just Christian, the government continues to tighten oversight, increase religious persecution, and attempt to co-opt state-sanctioned religious organizations. Well, China is another topic and would take me a much longer time to cover all the issues going on there. Turning to the a book, or a, turning to a newspaper in England, it's called The Guardian, and they have a headline here that's kind of intriguing. Where in the world is the worst place to be a Christian? Now, who would ever think that would be a headline in today's times? Persecution of Christians has increased dramatically in parts of the world. Here is a list of the top 25 anti-Christian countries, and I'm not going to include them here, but uh, you could probably guess a bunch of them. But the, the uh, countries of the world are making it tougher and tougher for Christians. And finally, one more survey. This is by the prestigious Pew Research Center. And they have a report here that says a closer look how religious restrictions have risen around the world. And they take a look at 2007 uh, up to 2017 in this report. And they say that on a one to 10 scale in 2007, uh, religious restrictions were at a 3.5 uh, factor, that, that's their factor. And it has risen to a 4.3. Now, you would think in today's times that that would be, have gone down uh, instead of being higher, but that's not the case. You know, today's religious persecutions will seem pale looking at this back from uh, in the future. Start over. But today's persecutions will seem pale in comparison to what's ahead during the Great Tribulation. So my question to you is this, how important is religious freedom to you? Will your faith in Jesus be shattered when global governments impose strict restrictions on your religious freedoms?
That's a question each one of us needs to think about and, and think of how we're going to address this. You know, my studies in the book of Revelation indicate that there is soon coming a one world government, a one world government. And if you read the papers today, you can see that there are many, many organizations around the world that are pushing for this to happen. But this is going to be different during the Great Tribulation, and it's going to happen overnight. It'll be amazing how fast this will happen. So the first beast of Revelation 13.1 is a seven-headed religious authority. And that religious authority will dictate to you religious laws that you must follow. So there's no option here. You follow these or else. So in Revelation 13.1 we read, Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads. That, in my analysis, that seven global religions. 10 horns and 10 crowns. Now, in this short video today, I'm not going to be able to go into all the study that I have done on this, but you'll find in the comment area, you will find links to a number of videos that I have done that have an in-depth study on Revelation 13 and the two beasts, the beast from the sea and the beast out of the earth. So I highly recommend that if you have an interest in this, that you'll follow those links and study those videos. They will give you something to think about. Well, you know, in Revelation 13, 3, it says the whole world marveled and gave allegiance to the seven-headed beast. So the whole world. And on 13, verse 8, it says all who dwell on the earth. Now that's A-L-L, -L, all. All means all. Well, in this case, it means all whose names are not written in the book of life that dwell in the earth will worship him, worship the beast from the sea. Well, what does it mean by worship? Does it mean that you're going to go and kiss their ring or bow down to them? Well, that's not exactly how this is going to work. What they're going to actually do in terms of worship is they're going to follow the dictates, the laws that this seven-headed beast enacts. So each country of the world will have different religious laws that you must follow. So this is covered again in the other videos that I have referenced that you can follow, follow with the links in the comment area below. Well, that's it for today's prophecy update. I want to thank you for taking time to view this study and I want you to stay tuned next time for another update in prophecy. God bless to you and your family.